Becky. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, hold on, let me. All right, can you see my presentation? Uh, I can see it, can everyone else? Does, is anyone not seeing it? Yes. I can see it. Great, okay. Well, thank you for that introduction. And yes, indeed, I do have a lifelong aversion to birds. Um, which my coworkers don't miss many opportunities to remind me of. Um, I wanted to talk with you today about um, something that we worked on here in Indiana to get ourselves as prepared as possible for an, an avian influenza incident in our state. Um, let's see, first, let's see. Um, so I maintain that proper management of waste should be a tool used to stamp out animal disease and not an obstacle that facilitates its spread. Um, and today, uh, we've got a, a several um, methods that we typically use to manage um, avian influenza waste. And today, I'm just going to focus on combustion, um, but I do have some thoughts and experiences on the other methods, and I'm happy to talk about those um, uh, at the end. So let me tell you how I kind of got into at least this part of it. Um, in May of 2015, we received a phone call from um, our Covanto Energy from Waste facility here in Indianapolis, which um, is, a, is a municipal solid waste incinerator. So um, if you've ever seen the movie Toy Story 3, um, at the very end, they have the little aliens running the giant claw. Well, that's the kind of facility that we have here in Indianapolis that handles all of our municipal solid waste. And they called and asked if we, if they could accept avian influenza waste that were being generated in Iowa. We pretty quickly got our state um, veterinarian, Dr. Brett Marsh, on the phone, and he said, no, you're not bringing that to Indiana. This is not a good idea. Um, and the facility themselves wasn't exactly sure how they would be able to manage the, the wastes in order to prevent spread of the disease. And as a regulator in terms of what, what their permit allowed them to do, we weren't sure. IDEM, uh, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, was not sure if their permit allowed them to accept these kinds of waste. So we had to say no to that request, and, and we knew that the people in Iowa were in a bad spot, and we weren't happy that we had to say no, but we weren't prepared to say yes. So uh, kind of with that as a challenge, um, as we moved on in our preparedness efforts throughout uh, 2015 and really focused a lot on the landfill option, I continued to kind of peck away at this, no pun intended, at this potential option uh, to see if there was a way that we could say yes. And eventually uh, that, that came around to the concept of doing an actual exercise um, to establish, once we worked through kind of the, the regulatory things and said, yep, you can, this is the kind of waste that you can accept. Um, we then, Covanta approached us and said, we'd really like to do a trial of this kind of material because we're not 100% sure, you know, that we can destroy this and that we can control things. Um, and, and they wanted to establish kind of what their operational parameters were. So um, we also did a lot of work, lots of coordination with our Indiana State Poultry Association and their members who were very interested in having as many options as possible in the event of an incident. So um, some of the reasons that, again, we were motivated to continue to look at this combustion facility option um, is that it's something that we can use kind of, there are some limitations, but in general, that facility runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It does have some down periods and periods where it's not accepting um, waste that we can kind of uh, use to our advantage, um, but it's always available. Um, and it's, it, it can be available very quickly. So it doesn't have to be um, 
kind of set up the way a landfill would be. Um, the other thing is that it would buy us some time. We, if there was an incident, we might be able to address um, waste generated from the index premise very quickly in this way, um, get them packaged up and get them to the combustion facility while we were sorting out what the scale of the incident was and what our other options were for waste management. Um, another advantage is that it could deal with just a small, a small amount or a, a pretty sizable amount. And I know in Indiana we had an incident um, in, a, in a smaller backyard flock, it was just 70 birds um, within the last 18 months here, um, that we ended up managing at our at Purdue University's incinerator. Um, but for those kind of scenarios, uh, gives us some, some flexibility when maybe opening a, a landfill to receive these kinds of waste just isn't practical. Um, it can also, a combustion facility can handle all the different waste that would be generated um, from an avian influence incident. Um, just a quick picture of the significance of the poultry industry in Indiana. It represents a $4.25 billion uh, direct contribution to our economy, which is quite sizable. We are, I think, number, it, the numbers change to some extent, but we're number three or four in the country for egg laying facilities. Um, it seems like two or three in pullets. And most significantly, we're number one in ducks, um, and our duck trade is almost um, entirely international. So um, we have a sizable um, industry and really just continues to grow and expand. So we really have something we need to protect here in Indiana. So this is a list of the group of groups that got together and kind of put our heads together and worked on this and supported um, this exercise. Um, the Indiana Board of Animal Health, uh, very much the, the lead agency and, and was absolutely instrumental in um, securing all the, getting all the biosecurity um, details addressed. Our Indiana State Poultry Association um, just had the strength of their membership and motivation and ultimately one of their members provided our sample waste. And then you can kind of see the rest of the group there. Um, let's see, Homeland Security, Department of Health, Department of Agriculture, um, Covanta themselves um, managing the waste, and then at the very bottom, Max Katz Bag, who you'll see provided the liners. So it's really a collaboration. All right, so next thing I'm going to do is run through um, some photographs and let you see what it is that we did, and, and then we'll go on into some questions. So our first order of business was to um, designate uh, biosecurity um, hot, warm, and cold zones. And here you can see examples of some of the activities that were going on in those different zones. We basically had a, a tractor trailer, like a 53-foot um, semi-tractor trailer, pulled up to the threshold between the cold and the warm zones. Um, and we prepared containers in the, warm, in the cold zone and then passed things back and forth. So this will all make more sense. Let's get to the photographs. All right, so we went to a, a large egg laying facility in Northern Indiana uh, that happened to be depopulating a 100,000 bird barn, um, just spent hens at the end of their productivity. They volunteered um, as many birds as we would like and the use of their facility for the day. We designated cold, warm, and hot zones, and you can see that marked off by the marking paint there. The, one of the very first things we did was work with Covanta to determine what sorts of containers could be introduced into their combustors. And the largest possible container is this roughly uh, cubic yard box. So I think these boxes are like 41 inches by 41 inches by 48 inches, uh, like triple wall corrugated cardboard boxes. Um, so we had Covanta provided the truck, they arrived with the trailer and um, uh, we had it, we ended up packing 30 boxes. So we had at least 30 boxes and wooden pallets. These were recycled boxes. They weren't of particularly good quality, um, which was, was fine. We weren't dealing with an infectious situation, but even in an infectious situation, they held up very well. So we constructed the boxes, um, placed them on pallets, and then on the right-hand side, you can see us cutting the liner material that goes inside the boxes. One of the hardest kind of the linchpins of this whole project was 
trying to find a liner uh, that could work in this container that wasn't a bio bag, that wasn't hard to access, that it was something that we could reasonably have on hand, but that was puncture resistant or puncture proof to chicken beaks, feet, and bones, and also moisture resistant. And I did eventually find that, um, and this is really a kind of a, like a concrete curing blanket material. Um, unfortunately, I can't show you my sample, but it's kind of felted on one side and then kind of a very dense woven uh, plastic on the other side. Anyway, we cut the liner into, uh, the liner comes in 100 foot long rolls. And so we cut it into 12, and it's 12 feet wide. We cut it into 16 foot long sections. So the best analogy I have for this is that we kind of treated it like tissue paper in a gift bag, kind of folded it up, stuffed it down into the box, and then opened it up. So you can see us here, this is a liner section that we've cut, and we're preparing to stuff it down into the box. We found the material's uh, pretty flexible, but still to get it in the right place, we used um, some two by fours that we had cut and were kind of rounded at the end so that we weren't puncturing anything. Um, so we lined each of the boxes, and this is all done in the cold zone. And I have um, numbers on numbers of people and amount of time that it took us to do all these different activities. Once the boxes were constructed and lined, we transported them um, through the warm zone and to the hot zone. In the hot zone, um, the uh, farm provided contractors that did the depopulation activities. And you can see on the left-hand photograph, the birds were um, depopulated using a a MAC cart and dumped into the box. This could be done in a lot of different ways. Our, our goal was to just test to see whether this whole thing worked, and there would probably be efficiencies that could be identified here, um, although I would say that this group was not what, have, what held us up through the day. So the birds are placed into the box. Um, we did fill one box and take it over to the weight scale, weighed it to get a sense of um, what, what kind of total package weight we were looking at so we didn't exceed our freight limitations on our, on our truck, and ultimately determined that uh, what ended up to be 400 layer hens, which is, I think, uh, 1,400 pounds of poultry, um, was appropriate for the box, allowed us to fold the flaps of the liner over, and allowed kept it within reasonable weight because uh, there's a certain strength limit of the box so kept it within the strength limit of the box and allowed for a little bit of freeboard there in the event of expansion. The packed boxes were then returned from uh, the hot zone to the warm zone. And uh, we were able to use forklifts and lulls through this whole process. They happened to be available at the farm um, in the event of a, an actual incident. You, just, you might need to rent some things. In the warm zone, uh, we then wrapped each of the boxes with um, like cling film, plastic film. And the purpose there was twofold. Um, most significantly, it was to give us a good surface to be able to disinfect. And kind of as a side benefit, we recognized that it also gave the box a little bit more structural integrity um, that it had before. Oh, I missed. In the, in the hot zone, the flaps of the boxes were, were closed and kind of folded, kind of woven in on top of each other to get a secure, a secure um, top there. So we wrapped it with plastic wrap and then disinfected the outside surface of it. And then it was transferred. Um, so you can see the back of the trailer there is right at that threshold between the cold zone and the warm zone. Um, so the, the filled sealed, disinfected boxes were then loaded into the tractor trailer. The um, tailgate was sealed. Uh, we tried as best we could to do um, all the paperwork that would typically accompany a waste load like this. Um, we did have the advantage, um, Covanta uh, provided us with a driver who was experienced with es escorted loads um, and who was familiar with transporting hazardous waste and infectious medical waste. Um, so he had a little better sense of what he was doing in terms of paperwork, but we did um, the Indiana permit to move the poultry product 
and then just a basic bill of lading. Uh, this, this form is actually a hazardous waste manifest, but that just happens to be the form that they use. Any sort of bill of lading would work as this is not a hazardous waste. So we put that all onto the truck. We got we loaded 30 containers, um, and and that really hit our weight limit. Uh, when the truck got to Covanta and went across the scales there, it was 79,500 pounds, and the limit was 80 80,000. So we were just right at our limit, um, and and that was with 30 boxes in the trailer. Now that was just a single layer of boxes, and you could. Um, in theory, do a double layer and get as many as 60 boxes into a trailer like that. Um, however, you'd have to have the freight weight requirements waived, and you also have to have some consideration for rural roads and bridges and whether you know you can actually safely transport that material. So um, the the waste was transported um, took no, it's about a two and a half hour drive from the farm to Indianapolis. Um, and so it arrived there in, in the very late afternoon, early evening. And it, after it checked in at the gate, it then pulled up to the um, unloading dock. The uh, facility operator there um, inspected the containers. All the containers had um, made the trip um, in, in good condition. After all of the containers were unloaded from the trailer, we then sprayed disinfectant again we weren't dealing with infected materials here, but we're just trying to, you know, do as much good practice as we can. Um, so disinfected the inside of the trailer. The boxes were then moved to a staging area that was adjacent to the waste storage pit. Um, and in the event uh, of an incident, uh, we would kind of move things in stages. So we would remove boxes from the trailer, put them in the waste storage pit staging area, and then as long as there hadn't been any releases, just do a simple disinfection of the ramp and the areas where the waste had passed through. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the boxes there kind of waiting. And if you look up in the right-hand corner, um, you can kind of make out what is a giant mountain of trash. So that's kind of where we're going. So all the boxes are, are staged, staged there adjacent to the waste storage pit. And let me step back again and describe this facility. So we have a pit about mm, 100 yards long, maybe 50 yards wide, 40 yards deep, um, up to which the trash trucks from the city of Indianapolis pull up to the back of this, and it's, it's, on, it's a tipping floor, and they then tip their trucks, and all the waste dumps into this giant pit. And this facility has three boilers and three separate large cranes. You can see um, the, the grapple is what we call it, but the large grapple kind of hanging up on the top of the right-hand photograph. Um, that grapple goes down, grabs a big bunch of waste, and feeds the different combustors. Um, the way things work in Indianapolis is that they are receiving uh, municipal waste from just, you know, the, the trash bin that you roll out to your, the end of your driveway um, comes in beginning about 5 a.m. and runs until 2 or 3 in the afternoon, they'll be receiving waste. So there's a very steady stream of waste here. Um, so that's primarily what the facility is designed for. They also accept um, on off hours um, lots of other waste that people are looking to have destroyed securely. Um, some of those are pharmaceuticals. Um, they have had contracts and do have contracts with USDA APHIS to handle international waste off of um, aircraft, international aircraft. Um, they do, yeah, like DEA drugs kind of thing. Anyway, all right. So these containers are placed out into the waste storage pit and kind of put up on top of a little mound of trash. And then the grapple comes down and it positions itself above the container and then goes down, grabs the container and the pallet that it's, still, it's sitting on and some waste underneath it. So it tries to get, you know, kind of the box and a little bit more waste to go with it. 
and it then lifts that box and brings it over to a combustion feeder sh feed chute. Um, and so that comes in and that's positioned. And then what the claw, they have the grapple kind of, kind of massage the box to get the pallet to drop away, to get the box to start to open a little bit so that the, the liner can drop out. Because we're trying to get this whole thing through a 42 inch opening. And so we open, open the boxes or we kind of try to get it to the point where it can go down the chute. And there you can see it entering the combustion feed chute. Uh, the white plastic that you're seeing is the liner. So the birds are inside there. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that the, the, the birds have entered uh, the combustion feed, feed chute. And the boxes and the pallets will slowly work down there. Let's see. All right. So before I go on, are there questions about just about what what I've just described? Okay. All right. So this is our exercise logistical package. So this is what we ended up doing. I'm going to real quick make sure Um, okay, so what we were able to do um, through our exercise was to manage um, 12,200 uninfected egg-laying hens, and we did that in 30 containers on top of 30 pallets. Um, and then this gives you a sense of kind of what we did. Um, ultimately, we did... Uh, and, and so that's, that's, our, that's, what we, that's what we did. And now this is what we hope, um, what we're working with our Indiana Department of, of Homeland Security to design a logistical package um, that if we needed to use this um, tool in the event of an incident, uh, we'd like to be able to provide a response that would be 150,000 egg-laying hens um, and, or the equivalent of 525,000 pounds of poultry material. So that could be ducks, turkeys, broilers, pullets, whatever we needed there. Um, and that gives you a sense of how much of each thing we think we would need there. Covanta is, at this point, um, willing to commit that they could, could accept 90 containers a day uh, for three consecutive days for a 12-hour period. Doesn't quite match up with our kind of dream package, uh, but close enough. And I think uh, they're just trying to be a little conservative there. Um, we have been working um, in Indiana with Covanta on a draft um, statement of work to try to get some sort of contract uh, or draft contract as close to signature as we can, um, not expecting that there be a, a finalized contract there, but, but to not have that be the obstacle to being able to use this tool. So we've been working through that. Uh, the other note there is that we, while we did this exercise in Indianapolis, Covanta has facilities really across the country. And largely, they have um, either the exact same or very comparable combustor units um, at their other facilities. So the thought is, what can be done here and the processing parameters they've identified through this exercise could be used at their other facilities. Again, I maintain that proper management of waste cannot be an effective tool with, to stamp out animal disease without preparedness. We have spent a significant amount of time and effort here in Indiana um, to be prepared for an avian influenza incident. And indeed, we, we had one um, in January of 2016. And you know, you, you're never going to prepare for absolutely everything, but certainly we were much better prepared to respond to that than we would have been. Um, most significantly, we did we were able to accept waste into a landfill there, um, even though they weren't infected. But we were able to get that done in very short order as a result of our preparedness. Um, let's see. 
So here's some contact information for me um, if you have uh, further questions. And I largely did this in cooperation with Dr. Maria Cooper um, with our Indiana Board of Animal Health, and she is an excellent resource um, for any questions that you have about biosecurity concerns or really almost anything related to avian influenza. She and several of her colleagues were very much involved in this entire process and were with us um, all day um, working through this um, and did a lot of the advanced work as well. And I continually asked them, you know, well, what do you think? You know, how are we doing on the biosecurity thing? Is this a reasonable way to contain this disease? And, and they were very, very satisfied with the controls that they saw. And I know would be happy to, to talk with anybody who's interested there. Okay, and that kind of ends my the formal part of my presentation. I do have additional background information on the end of this um, presentation, and I can reference that for specific questions, or you can reference that um, offline. Um, so happy to take any questions that you might have now. Anyone there's one question on the there's one yeah, question on the chat. Somebody's asking about burning okay. the pallets. All right. Yes, I do see. I'm just seeing that now. Thank you. Um, yes, they do burn the wooden pallets. And we talked. One of some of the other options we looked at in terms of containers were boxes that would have the pallets um, integrated into them, and that's an option. Uh, but probably in general, Covanta liked the pallet that dropped away. Um, the other containers we evaluated, um, or that I know have been evaluated, they've been working on a, a, some similar trials in New Jersey, have used 55-gallon poly drums and I think kind of a smaller plastic tote box, maybe some fiber drums as well. And the Covanta facility here in Indianapolis could, um, could accommodate all of those uh, types of containers, but we were just really focused on um, evaluating this kind of worst case container. So that is the worst case container. They, they, there's no combo box or other um, way to get the birds there in a larger container than that. Well, if I think for biosecurity purposes, in order to to have them, you know, wrapped in, it, it wasn't exactly sealed, but in you know to have them really contained and reduce that opportunity for the disease, for the virus to get outside of the packaging, that was the largest size package we could do. And that's the largest size that could be, basically that what I've shown you with the grapple, you know, that's, that's the maximum size container that they can directly introduce into their um, combustion feed chute. All right, any other, other questions? questions for Becky? Okay, if we don't have any other questions for Becky, thank you very much, Becky. Really appreciate uh, appreciate the presentation, your time, and the information. It uh, looks like a really great option. Thank you. and. Yeah, I'm, we're very interested in in getting some feedback. You know, we're enthusiastic about what we've done here in Indiana, and we think it's a very viable option. But if in looking at this, you see things that you think are stoppers, I would very much appreciate your sharing that with us. Um, we really are interested in receiving constructive criticism here, if if there is any. Anyway, thank you Great. for your time thank and attention. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Um, so everyone, um, um, first off, thanks to Becky for, for a great presentation. Um, I wanted to let you all know that we're working on hopefully next week having um, South Dakota talk about their procedures using fire trucks retrofitted with spummer for nozzles for depopulating broilers. 
Um, we're not sure if we don't have confirmation that they'll be able to make it, but um, but we're hoping that they can. Um, and then we're also looking at maybe for the meeting on the 30th of November, having a <clears throat> um, presentation on the the no, the new mobile swine electrocution depopulation unit and swine composting. Um, that's being tested, and there's training being done on that next week. And then uh, hopefully we can have both a um, a presentation on on the the test and also some some uh, composting SMEs talk about composting swine. And I was uh, told earlier today that we're looking at having a videographer go down from Ames, Iowa to the test site next week and videotape the way the unit works. So um, that might be available as well. Um, we are, however, not going to have a meeting on the 23rd, the day before Thanksgiving. So I will send out a cancellation for that uh, in the near future. Um, I did want to throw out to everyone, and I know we don't have everyone on the call today, so I'll, I'll also throw it out to the, the invite list, but um, the I wanted to get everyone's sense of whether you all are familiar enough with the West Texas wheel wash and the non-freezing portable vehicle wash tunnel that you don't see a need to have a presentation on it right now. Um, and, and as background for that, um, the West Texas wheel wash and non-freezing portable vehicle wash tunnel is being uh, demoed over the next year um, down in Alabama. And then it's going to go up to uh, Andy, help me out. I don't remember. So I think it's going up to Iowa for a month or so in the in the cold. Am I correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so and so over the next year, we're going to be testing that out. Um, but and so obviously at the end of that year, you know, we'll have probably be able to have a presentation on how well the the test went and, and how well it works. In the meantime, is there interest in seeing an overview presentation of this wheel wash and, and um, portable vehicle wash tunnel? Yes. Okay. Hey, Drew, this is Andy. I, I, I think I uh, having, seen, having seen the first iteration of that, the, uh, uh, the one that we used that was shown up in Wisconsin that um, had, had some problems, I think it would be worthwhile to a, an awful lot of folks, including me, to, to see the new version of that. Excellent. Cool. So we'll work on that then. And um, that's all I've got for the moment, um, unless anyone else has. Drew, this yes, is Deborah Nelson, and I wanted to just bring everybody, just let everybody know that we've been working on a process to um, approve and then maybe eventually deliver skid steer training. And we've got a group that's working on this. They're part of the National Via Safety Environmental Health Protection Committee. We have a subcommittee on training, and we pulled in some experts from, uh, you know, outside APHIS. And we are getting close to having a document that um, we would like to have your group review if you're interested. Okay, great. Did I say skid steer training? I meant to say yes. that. Yes, ma'am. My blood did. sugar is getting a little low here. So. I totally understand. Um, that that sounds great. And yeah, um, if you, when it's done, if you want to send it our way, but, um, anyone we'll who's interested, that. we'll we'll take a look at it. All righty. Um, any other items for the group today? Okay, hearing none, um, we will have a call this time next week. Um, and if we do manage to get confirmation from South Dakota that they can make it, uh, we'll be on this Blue Jeans line, uh, system. 
If not, um, we will be on the APHIS uh, call-in number, and as, as usual, I will let you all know the day before and the day of where we're going to be. Thank you all very much.